Here now this reading from the Hebrew Bible from Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of the Mamre, as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour needed and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared, and he set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced and aged. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I've grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh, yes, you did laugh. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, Who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh God, of all the words spoken this day, may it be your living word that remains. Give us the grace to receive it and the charity to let all the other words slip away. Amen. Knowing the propensity for some of us in this room to spend far more time on Facebook than we should, I'm betting some of you have seen this video. There's this older couple and it's in a kitchen and there's this bottle of water underneath which there is a penny, and this woman, who must be this man's wife, says to him, I'm going to do a magic trick. Look in here, and you will watch the penny go from underneath the bottle into the bottle. And of course, the man looks, and she squeezes the bottle. Have you seen this? Gets all over him, and she howls in laughter. I mean, and if you've seen it, or if you've seen videos like this, you find that you're laughing at someone else who is in a moment of pure loss of control. In their laughter, there is a contagious nature to this. It's part of our social cues to laugh and to laugh with. And if you haven't seen it, you need to find it. If you want a good laugh, it's just too easy, uh, and it's wonderful. And he, the subject of the joke, finds that he is uncontrolled in his laugh as well, and it is a joyful thing to observe. Why do we laugh? How is it that we find ourselves in a place to laugh, and what do we laugh at? Why 
does it stir up in us at times, and then there are other times it does not. The science of laughter uh, is far more extensive than I had appreciated until this week as I did a little work. And I will not uh, in any way try to explain it all, but there are types of laughter that you know. Listen to a baby laugh and see if that does not elicit an immediate response in you. That's that laugh, that's that nervous kind of laugh. You know something's not really funny, but it's how we kind of process an uncomfortable moment. That kind of nervous laughter that says, when can I leave? Those kind, that kind of laughter. There's the polite laugh. It's not particularly funny, but you're my boss, so therefore I will laugh a little bit with you. Indeed, there is the contagious laugh, the kind of laugh that happens in a place and at a time where you're really not supposed to be laughing, like at church, and a whole row gets going about something that's happened back on the back pew that you don't think us up here see, but yes, we do, and we know that this happens, so we get it. There's the belly laugh, and what I've read this week is that the belly laugh is undoubtedly the most honest laugh because you are lost in a belly laugh. They're not constant, thank goodness, because I think too many of them might kill us, but one, every now and again, is good medicine. And if a snort comes along with it, even better. That is a singular moment. And then there's, there's the cynical laugh, the oh sure, right laugh. My guess, that's Sarah's laugh in this reading. Now, to do a whole series on the story of Abraham and Sarah is worthy of our time, but we're not doing that this morning. I just want to lock in on this particular episode, if you will, in their life together. And notice that within this reading, from Genesis, there's so much there that is interesting to note. For example, if you want a lesson in what radical hospitality looks like, read the first few verses of this chapter again. Abraham has guests and does everything he can do to, with the best of what he has to provide for his guests' needs. Every church ought to be cueing on those first few verses alone and how we welcome guests into our space. But that's not really why you came. We really want to focus on this, this promise that is made to Abraham and to Sarah well up in years, well up in years about a promise God is making that even at their age, they shall have a child. Now, have you ever given a cynical laugh at something asserted to you that you know, hey, no way that's happening? Oh, sure, you got to be kidding. Sometimes we laugh in our lives to keep from crying. Sometimes we, cry, we laugh in our lives and we cry because it brings us to tears. There might have been a little bit of that in this story with Sarah, but my sense is far more than anything else, it was the laughter at the prospect of something promised to her could be true given the reality of her circumstance. And then there's that word, is anything too wonderful for the Lord? Words similarly will be spoken with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the promise that she shall have a child as well, about the wonder of God, the possibilities that are not impossible with God. Well, we know the story comes here, and she um, is confronted that she laughed. Why did Sarah laugh? Why did Sarah laugh at God? And Sarah says, I didn't laugh. 
I didn't laugh. And God says, oh, yeah, you did. Oh, yeah, you did. In a moment of impossibility, seemingly, in your life and in your journey, and there are words spoken through Scripture, through a friend, words spoken of hope that seem to be at odds with the context of your moment. And you laugh cynically at the possibility that what you are living with and through could be anything other than what you see in front of you. And we laugh cynically that it is what it is. I got what I got. But the prospect that an imaginative God can find a way for you to endure and to live through your situation. Have you ever had that happen in your life? And if you have, even at the slightest level, you can resonate with Sarah in this story. It's laughable for her to think that she can have a child at her age. Laughable to the point of hilarity. And even when God confronts us with our cynicism, and we go, oh, no, Lord, I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing with you, that kind of thing. You can hear the God of all creation and all imagination say, oh, yeah, you did. You laughed. But you watch. You wait. You see. Sarah had a child. Sarah named this child Isaac. You know what Isaac, the name, means? He laughed. He laughed. And God was faithful. As they were. In their life, and in their journey, and in their ministry together. So what do we take away from this ancient text this morning? A couple of things, it seems to me. Laughter is great medicine. Laughter, even when all seems right with the world, is helpful. Laughter, though, when we are in times of great pain, is now, evidently, scientifically proven to increase our threshold for the pain we're enduring. Again, if you're a scientist, statistician stuff, go on the internet and knock yourself out. But I just wanted the bottom line. I wasn't going to read all the data like some of you do, John, uh, but it's there. <laughs> the release of endorphins when we laugh. Thinking about the times of pain in my life that I have experienced relationally, physical pain I've endured, pain that comes from loss, pain that comes from disappointment, pain that comes from the realization that the way I thought something might turn out is not at all what it's going to be. And what would it have meant for me to have been more conscious about a God-given laugh to help heal the brokenness of my heart. Could it be, in addition to the social conventions of laughing together, that God has given us this story and laughter as an enduring spiritual gift to help us endure what we could not otherwise believe possibly we could? Even in this moment, 
amidst whatever the impossibility might be in your life. Maybe something worthy of Sarah. I don't know. Could be. What then shall we do? How shall we proceed to allow the possibility of life and laughter and God's imagination to enter into the parts of us that we wall off? Hear this word from among my favorite of writers, John O'Donohue. The passage is titled, Turn the Key and Enter. He says, Had you but the courage to acknowledge the haunted inner room, turn the key and enter, you would encounter nothing strange or sinister there. You would meet some vital self of yours that had been banished during a time of pain and difficulty. Sometimes, when life squeezes you into lonely crevices, you may have to decide between survival and breaking apart. The banished self from an earlier time of life remains within you, waiting to be released and integrated. The soul has its own logic of loyalty and concealment Ironically, it is usually in the most awkward rooms that the, that the special blessings and healing are locked away. And we access those places that we lock away from ourselves, from God, by laughter, God's gift to us. find a way to laugh well, and to God be the glory. Amen.